Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Rook with Matt Bennett, agmarket.net. Well, the livestock futures mixed on the day with the grains to the plus side. And Matt, let's talk about the grains because a pretty impressive day. You started off lower and managed to end higher. Boy, this market has been certainly very resilient. Is this all fun buying in your mind? I think there's a lot of fun buying going on. I mean, there's no doubt the funds have trimmed their positions the last few weeks in here. Uh, they've got more uh, work to, go, to do as far as soybeans and what they do with corn. Uh, you look at why the funds have uh, remained so short soybeans. It makes sense. You know, there's a lot of soybeans in the world domestically. There's a lot of soybeans. And so you can kind of understand where they're coming from. But as you get towards the end of month and end of quarter, you know, there's some uh, stuff going on in the world that I, I think has given them an opportunity to go ahead and, and book some profits, make their books look good here uh, towards the end of the quarter. And of course, China is one of those things. Uh, you look at Chinese uh, interest here this week, they continue to buy some beans. Uh, whenever you look at China cutting their interest rates, there's no doubt that there's some uh, reason to be optimistic of the Chinese economy. So what do the funds do here? I mean, how much of their short have they gotten out of? Do they want to go flat in this market or what's your thought? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I don't know that they want to go flat just yet. I mean, who knows? I mean, the thing is, Michelle, there's a lot of beans in the world. There's a lot of beans in uh, in the U.S., no doubt. Uh, you look at the world balance sheet. Uh, USDA likes to use this two-year window. You know, and you're talking a little over 100 million tons up to around 134 coming out of this year if people produce like the USDA is saying. And a uh, 33% increase in world bean stocks is, uh, is not bullish by any stretch of the imagination. So I can't imagine that the funds want to get flat here. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, uh, sometimes you get one of these rallies that's counter seasonal. Uh, typically, fall's not the time for that. But Brazil is very dry. Uh, most forecasts show uh, a really good chance that they're going to get some rainfall in October, enough to get stuff seeded. Now, are we going to turn off dry from there? Who knows? Uh, but most of your forecasts don't seem to be terribly worried. And of course, they're going to plant more beans once again this year. I got to ask you, you know, you mentioned it, we're in the middle of harvest. How unusual is it to rally like this during harvest and how hard is it going to be able to sustain a rally during harvest? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question, Michelle. I mean, it's it's a little unusual to go ahead and, and rally here uh, whenever you get into harvest. I mean, a lot of times when, when you get into this situation, of course, there's a fair amount of farmer selling, a lot of hedge pressure that comes into the market. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the bigger question is how hard would it be to sustain a rally? And without kind of a flow from equities towards commodities, uh, which would be a shift that we haven't seen for a while, uh, certainly comes in, uh, it's a cyclical type thing. Uh, if you get that, there's a chance that you could maintain a rally. But beyond that, Michelle, from a fundamental standpoint, there's very few reasons uh, to rally this bean market. I don't want the market to go lower. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that uh, there's not a whole lot of reasons whenever you look at, even if the U.S. bean crop's a little bit lower, let's say, for instance, um, you know, right now you're looking at a 550 carry. Uh, let's say you take the crop down a bushel. You know, you're still looking at something pushing 500 million bushels. So it's pretty tough to get to get here in a bullish position right now. Yes, we've rallied, but I'd be very cautious as a grower. Our mind wants us to get bullish whenever the market rallies. Be very cautious with that, you know, and maybe uh, look at it as a selling opportunity. Yeah. How much has been sold? Both new crop. We, I've got to believe we don't have a lot of sales there made and we're still making old crop sales yet, aren't we? Yes, we are. There's still old crop stuff hitting the market. I mean, you hear elevators getting full. Uh, it, it's uh, a bit of an issue uh, how undersold the grower was. Yeah, I got to believe that most growers are, are going to do what they typically do and not store beans. But at the same time, you know, some of these systems are actually given a pretty good incentive for the grower to sell and uh, essentially sell for January or, you know, sell for December in some cases. Uh, I think space is very limited right now. You know, and so basis isn't very good at, at all uh, as we get into harvest. And it's probably going to get worse. Uh, but pay very close attention because it might be in your best interest to go ahead and sell, you know, even just a January. But uh, we've heard of some folks picking up 60, 70 cents in that time frame. Yes, I understand commercial storage costs are high, but they're not that high. Let's go back and talk about one of the fundamentals you mentioned, which was China. Rumors that they've been in buying soybeans, obviously, some additional business, but also their talk of uh, their stimulus package. They lowered interest rates. 
How much is that going to translate into extra demand for the U.S., if any? You know, extra demand is the tough one. Here's the problem, Michelle. When you start talking about extra demand, we already feel like the USDA has baked too much demand into this current marketing year balance sheet. Uh, they've got exports quite a bit higher than what our current uh, uh, pace pace analysis would show. And so uh, I'll tell you what, maybe the USDA knew something before we did. But uh, as far as increasing, for instance, export demand, I'd really struggle to see that happen as far as uh, U.S. exports to China are concerned. It's always a possibility, but uh, right now I've got to think that it's more of a, a goodwill feeling that everyone's got. Hey, you know, China's going to try to support this economy uh, with them doing so. Typically, that means uh, more purchasing from everyone, uh, considering uh, there's such a, a huge uh, population, huge economy. So I don't know about extra demand, though. I, I'd, I'd be a tough sell on that one. I'm with you on that. What about uh, Brazil weather, weather premium? Are we putting premium into this market here? Um, and is it too early to be concerned about that? Because we would have to have a pretty big problem in Brazil to really move the meter, wouldn't we, or the needle? Yeah, I mean, the thing is with Brazil is you've got uh, more beans planted once again. And so a lot of beans planted, uh, some of the estimates, if they had a normal crop size, 170 million tons, it'd just be a massive crop. And so, yeah, you'd have to cut into this Brazilian crop size uh, substantially, in my opinion, you know, to be able to to start getting friendly there. Now, yes, they're dry. I mean, they're historically dry. Uh, some parts of Brazil, they're talking, uh, you know, some of the worst ever drought they've seen. But uh, typically they start getting rainfall once you get into this October time frame. That's when they like to do a lot of seeding. Uh, there's no doubt that um, uh, most of the forecasts are in agreement uh, that they're going to get some rainfall. So with that being the case, uh, my bigger concern, Michelle, would be if they get, for instance, pushed back a little bit as far as planting goes. If they've got some areas too dry uh, for some of your farmers down there to feel good about planting, uh, then you start to push back, for instance, uh, uh, planting, you push back harvest. You know, And when you push back harvest, it starts to call into question some of the planting of the safrina crops. So to me, that's one that I would keep a very close eye on, you know, if this October weather doesn't turn out like forecasts would suggest, because there's no doubt that the Brazilian grower, Argentine grower, and, uh, you know, even some of your U.S. growers are looking at input costs versus, for instance, the price of corn, you know, and scratching their head on trying to find black ink. So uh, you may not have to give the Brazilian producer a lot more reasons to maybe back off corn planting this year. Uh, and so I guess the timing of the harvest for Brazilian first crop soybeans is one of them that really needs to happen in, in, a, time, in a timely fashion. Let's talk about technicals because that is one of the things that has brought the funds in here to buy. November beans did close above 1050, but December corn couldn't close above the old high of 416. So now what? Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how we kind of trade there on Thursday. I mean, if you can close up here on corn and uh, make a little bit of a run there, 416, then it opens the door to maybe 426, 430 area, uh, and potentially extending all the way to 440. Now, the thing is, Michelle, uh, technically, you can make a case for some of these levels, but fundamentally, how do you get there? You know, and I think that uh, uh, clearly a lot of traders are very heavily focused on the technicals. Uh, that's what they trade. But from a fundamental standpoint, we also have to consider, you know, what does stocks look like? What, what, uh, for instance, what's going to happen next Monday? I mean, you know, this quarterly stocks report, I would think it's going to be pretty tough to get past, you know, as far as uh, giving us bullish info over on the soybean side of things. You're right. I mean, really on Tuesday, we raced higher, had a pretty poor close, you know, but then on Wednesday, we had a pretty rough overnight and then ended up with double digit gains, 20 cents off the lows. So that really looks good. But as far as what levels we're looking at, uh, you get above this 1050 area. And I do think November November beans have the chance to work up into that 1080 area potentially, especially if we continue to see the kind of buying that we've seen. Uh, I am not convinced that will happen, but technically it certainly looks like it could. Not that this normally happens, but is wheat following corn and soybeans? Is that technical or is there something fundamental pushing that market? You know, with wheat, uh, there was talk, of course, this morning that uh, U.S. might be looking at the biggest export number they've had in several years. Uh, but at the same time, of course, Russia has cheap wheat available. So uh, it's pretty tough to say. A lot of times you get in the doldrums, you know, the wheat market can kind of lead you out of it. 
uh, from a technical or from a fundamental standpoint here in the U.S. I don't know that I can kind of put my finger on anything there. But I would say when you look at this world balance sheet on wheat, you continue to kind of whittle away at world stocks. Uh, definitely run in lower stocks and stocks to use ratios than what uh, we've seen in years past. I mean, it wasn't uncommon to see a 50% plus stocks to use ratio on wheat, whereas uh, we're significantly below that at this point in time. So I got to think that wheat's kind of uh, following along. Uh, some of this world unrest could definitely play into the wheat market. We, we've seen that happen before. Uh, but as of right now, I don't think that that's what's driving wheat so much as looking over across the aisle. And let's uh, wrap up on cattle. We've had a nice run here. We've uh, seen charts really turning very positive. Um, today we closed mostly higher except for the nearbys, but didn't do any chart damage at all. So do you think that market can keep running? Are the funds going to start buying more? That's the big question, you know, and we've expected bullish cattle on feed reports. We haven't really got a really bullish one by any means. Um, are we going to get them here this fall? Again, that'd be versus a year ago. Some of those numbers a year ago were big. So you've got to think that maybe you could get a bullish uh, cattle on feed report in here. To me, I mean, we've been kind of following along here over the last uh, week or so uh, with the equities kind of following higher. Uh, equities look a little overcooked to me, and so I'd be a little hesitant. Uh, at the same time, uh, this cattle market, in my opinion, uh, has just been on a tear up above all of your moving averages. And so, you know, I don't know that I want to buy it up here. I think that uh, as a grower, uh, as a producer, you know, a rancher, I mean, you've got to look at this as a, as a good place to layer in some floors at the very least, because uh, uh, we've seen cattle market, uh, of course, just a year ago, you know, we dropped, uh, what, 30, 35 bucks and got to be very cautious as to get bullish whenever we just sat here and rallied $10. All right. Thanks for joining us, Matt Bennett with agmarket.net. That is Markets Now.